Hi everyone, welcome to Wandering DMs. I'm Paul. And I'm Dan. And on this episode of Wandering DMs, we have a special pre-taped interview with uh, Mr. Tim Woods, who is the designer of the Green Knight role-playing game. Get the, get the product on screen, Dan. It is right there. Um, <laughs> which was made in association with the uh, movie by A24 Films that is currently in theaters and anywhere that you rent videos. Um, Paul, have you seen the Green Knight film? I've not. I've not. I've not. Have you seen it? Uh, well, I did. I, Isabel and I saw it uh, opening weekend. We really, really liked it, and we were actually talking about it for days later. It's a really nice, thoughtful, philosophical fantasy film. Uh, A24 Films kindly hooked us up with uh, with Tim to talk about his design. And, and I think today, Tim and I are going to try to convince you, Paul, to go see the movie, because we really liked it. Okay, great. 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 <laughs> Uh, I guess we should say word of warning, of course, that we're uh, we're streaming this live uh, during uh, Hurricane Henry, uh, so hopefully no, no uh, um, you know nobody loses power or internet or anything like that while we're uh, in the midst of streaming this. Uh, but I think it should be all right. I think we should be fine. Right. But right. Uh, stay safe, and, everyone. Uh... Correct, and we will. Uh, so we'll be we'll be playing the pre-taped interview here. We were there were all kinds of scheduling issues in the past week. Uh, uh, Paul's very busy, Tim's very busy, and so I just narrowly managed to find an hour to get together with Tim and run the interview. Uh, Paul and I will be in the live chat on YouTube and Twitch while we're playing this, as usual. So uh, feel free to tell us uh, your thoughts while it's playing, and then we'll come back at the end uh, for a little wrap up. Great, great. So shall I uh, roll the interview, Dan? Right, Run the tape, Paul. So Here I'm joined here. today by uh, Tim Woods, who is a professional DM. <laughs> he has a doctorate in English literature. He's taught around the world, and he's currently the designer for the Green Knight RPG that's linked to the A24 Films release that's currently in theaters. Uh, Tim, thank you so much for making time with us today. Absolutely, Dan. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. That's that's <laughs> that. I've been really kind of excited about this. Let's start by talking about the Green Knight uh, film. Absolutely. Um, there we go. Um, so we'll look at a couple images here while we talk about this. So uh, for anybody that doesn't know, the Green Knight is a classic legend from uh, Arthurian myth, and possibly the most the most well known one actually. Mm -hmm. And uh, A twenty films produced a uh, fantasy film based on that. It's written and directed by David Lowry. It stars Dev Patel as Sir Gawain. Um, and my partner, Isabel, and I, who shows up on this show once in a while, actually, Tim, saw it opening weekend. It's the kind of thing that we love. Uh, we kind of adored it, and yes. we talked about it for days. So my mm -hmm. first question is, how did you end up with A24 Films to work on this project? Absolutely. So it was really cool because when A24 reached out to me uh, mentioning in the email that they were doing this movie called The Green Knight, I got really nervous because I thought they assumed that me with my background in Dungeons and Dragons, I was just going to like be able to tell them about medieval knights and how they lived and stuff. And I'm like, that, there's historians for that. I just make stuff up. That's my <laughs> job. So I, I was a little nervous that they were going to have expectations that wouldn't really match what I had to offer. I wasn't sure what they were bringing me in for. And once they brought me in, it became very clear. They explained that they were looking to kind of, you know, they knew that Dungeons & Dragons RPG fans were going to be interested in this movie, and something they wanted to release alongside the movie was a role-playing game. And when they kind of put this idea before me and talked about the work they had done on it so far. First of all, I think they were impressed that I had basically taken a whole class, for all intents and purposes, on just the story of the Green Knight in medieval literature and, you know, right. Tolkien's influence on the translations and interpretation of the, the Green Knight myth. I agree. I think it's one of the best-known Arthurian stories and definitely one of the toughest, I could imagine, to try to make a game out of. When you think about the fact that the story yeah. of the Green Knight is all about what is a quest, though? And it's like, okay, well, that's an amazing question, a hard one to take Dungeons and & Dragons and to ask that, you know, in, within a system like that. So I immediately knew, well, we want to do something a little different than D&D, &D, something that's more focused on how the movie kind of takes this idea of, well, quests are great, but what are they really in questioning that inherent fundamental premise, essentially? And uh, basically just like I warn them, you know, 
we can, I think this is a great idea. There's also a hundred ways it can go wrong. When you are trying to design an RPG, I think that we as fans of RPGs kind of have a better idea of how easy it is to bite off more than you can chew, for example. I think it's very natural, actually, that the more people play RPGs, so many of us in the hobby do naturally evolve into modifying the game, then making our own games, making kind of twists on games that we like, reinterpreting games in various ways. So I think actually a lot of RPG fans have experience when it comes to ga uh, game design, uh, framing RPGs in different ways. And I just luckily had done enough work in game design to know like, okay, how much time do we have? And when they told me like basically like three or four months, I was like, cool, this will be very different than how most RPGs are created because we're on a time frame. We have something we want to release and it was really cool recognizing like, okay, we need to have these core mechanics locked down almost immediately within a week or two. And then we can kind of extrapolate beyond that. And at the end, getting to take just those core ideas grow them, and then have a box set by the end of the process, I feel like I got to be part of something that, you know, is, is a unique in the RPG industry where it's like something that really needed to get made on a schedule that was going to get made, but the design that went into yeah. it had to kind of be um, a, a fast track, as it were. Uh, I, th I thought it was a really cool process to kind of be a part of, basically. Fascinating. Fascinating. It's not something I expected to see, honestly. I didn't expect to see an RPG linked to a movie release. I got to thank one of one of our patrons, William, actually, for pointing it out, for finding mm -hmm. the Green Knight RPG on the A24 site. Otherwise, I wouldn't have known to get in, get in touch with you. Absolutely. What kind I of... Think it's so, yeah, go ahead. I think it's just a really cool thing because it's like, this is new, definitely. I don't think 10 years ago we would see movies being accompanied with RPG releases to promote them. And yet at the same time, it's not unique. So many big companies are making the attempt at releasing their own RPGs due to the popularity of D&D with mixed results. And so it was cool to be a part of the process of like making sure that this was one of those good examples as opposed to kind of just like the Burger King RPG or something like that kind of. <laughs> We, that, 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 it's funny because we had a, we had a chat on on our patrons Discord after a show, and it was it was really your game that really brought those other ones to my personal attention. Is I didn't realize that this was as much of a trend actually, and at mm -hmm. least for me, the other ones I guess I guess I might have seen them promoted, but they didn't interest me enough to really pay attention. And it's mm -hmm. your Green Knight RPG that finally got me thinking about this whole trend at the moment, which is so well done. Well done on it's that. It's a very I, interesting I one, and I've that. observed it's kind of like all ships rising where I see other people getting opportunities now. I just think that the mainstreaming of the RPG hobby is going to create opportunities for everybody in this field. It's very exciting. Yeah, quite. Now, what? so the, the, the game that you've got in the box set kind of echoes the movie, right? It has scenes that kind of echo scenes in the movie. They are not exact duplicates, and if somebody yeah, comes in... <laughs> And, and thinks they're going to beat the game by doing exactly what has to happen in the movie. They're going to be they're going to be tricked. One hundred percent. You wouldn't know what's yeah. going to happen just from having watched the movie. And by the same token, you could play the whole game, and it really wouldn't spoil anything in the movie necessarily. It's going to have a lot of the same themes and ideas, and I think they complement each other without either of them spoiling each other or revealing anything. That's a that's a good point. What kind of resources did you have from A24? Did you have a script? Did you have like an early cut of the movie to, to work off? I did get to read the script, and that actually did a pretty good job of conveying exactly what was going to be going on in this movie. Uh, the, you know, the tone, the atmosphere, the kind of themes that they were dealing with. And then when I got to see an actual cut of the movie uh, ahead of release, a uh, big time ahead of release, considering everything that happened this year, the release getting delayed of the movie, yeah. I got to see it a while ago and really had that kind of sense of what they were doing with the story to kind of chew on and work with. One of the most rewarding things seeing people do live plays of my game online is seeing people be like, well, hold on. That means the game is saying this about honor. And I'm like, oh, yes, it is. But only because that's what the movie said. So I'm just like faithfully reporting as opposed to kind of presenting my own ideas. I'm kind of just like, well, yeah, if you feel like yes or no, you agree or disagree with this about the game, then kind of that's how the movie presents it. 
it. So I'm kind of hopefully you'll agree or disagree based on that too. Super. So I think that I think that comes through really well. Uh, and I guess before you know, we always like to dig into the nitty gritty details about our game mechanics. Before I mm-hmm. do that, I got to say we are you know huge fans of Arthurian myth to begin with, and mm-hmm. you know my, probably the, the single most read book in my life is this copy of White's Once and Future King, which I read. Love about. It. Now I take care of my books really carefully. But I read this one about every 10 years, and you can see that this one's pretty well used up at this point. Oh, 100%. Um, you know, Disney's Sword in the Stone is, is something that's mm-hmm. very much on Paul's mind. Another one of our patrons named Stephen Wendell actually wrote a whole series called The Little Lot Series, which is a retelling of Lancelot Tales in the context of a young boy playing with toys. And there's some D&D rules that even get mixed in there. That's so um, good. I right? love that. Right? Oh, yes. Right? So we were, we were pretty thrilled when Stephen told us about his Little Lot series. So how much Arthurian legends did you read previously or other Arthurian inspirations that went into the Green Knight game? I mean, it's it's almost hard to parse out because it's Arthurian mythology is so ingrained as the fundamental uh, uh, lore behind like Tolkien's ideas and then evolving into modern fantasy. I just uh, it's hard for me to extrapolate. I, they were I was so immersed in the the lore of King Arthur and the knights that uh. Um, I, I, I definitely grew up around them. I loved all, as you're kind of highlighting, the different interpretations, the different takes on them. And there was a period when I was very, getting very excited about like doing my own takes kind of on Arthurian mythology. So it's been fun to do it through a game. But I I love the idea that I think it's fundamental where people love to take these archetypal myths and reinterpret them in a variety of ways, whether it's as, you know, Lancelot as a little kid, people from different cultures. Uh, I know there's a new book release i am blanking on the name but it's essentially arthurian mythology uh transposed into different cultures i thought the idea of arthurian sci-fi is like a unexplored (laughs) opportunity kind of where it's like you could have knights in space and i'm just very interested in how people take arthurian myths and reinterpret them in the same way people take DD as a way to take tolkien and reinterpret a traditional fantasy in a lot of ways. I, I um I definitely remember growing up with the Sword in the Stone and a lot of like Arthurian books designed for kids. And then I went through that phase in college where I'm like, wait, where does this all come from? Finding Le Mort de Arthur and all those like books where and kind of cobbling together the idea that like, well, actually, we don't have one text. We have a lot of different texts that we're working with. And this is kind of a cobbled together history. And I ended up doing a lot of research just kind of on my own uh, being fascinated with this subject. So I, I guess it was just always around me at all ages as a kid and older, basically. That, that's pretty great. And we, I mean, I think that many of us game designers, uh, you know, RPG designers have this fight of uh, going down a pipe of research. And at some point we mm-hmm. have to come back up and actually write something. Absolutely, uh, so 100%. Right. <laughs> Mm-hmm. It's, it's, uh, that's where it's nice to have a company telling you you're on a schedule and stuff because all I could think of yes. was how many like novels and games in the Arthurian genre that I had been you know already starting working on that never quite got completed. A common story yes. in RPG design, but 100%. Wait, it's interesting because I, I just saw a talk by uh, the head designer of Magic the Gathering, and that was one of his like top twenty points is that restrictions create you know make creativity. And if you have that a whole, was, right? Mm-hmm. That was actually one that. of the most exciting things about this process was A24 basically saying, this is when we need to have this game by. And me being like, well, that's a very that's a short amount of time for an RPG, but I don't know that it's too short. And I don't know that it's actually not a perfect limitation, restriction. As you're saying, restrictions do, I think, promote a lot of things and and uh, both the restriction of knowing that this was how much time we had to work with and knowing the uh, kind of uh, demographics I wanted to appeal to RPG players but also people who are considering RPGs and maybe haven't played them before I wanted very clearly this game to be accessible to them and that's a tricky thing because 
because I think in the RPG industry, we have an idea of how accessible our games are. And as somebody whose job is 90% of the time, I'm bringing D&D to people who have never played it before. I am very often in the uncomfortable position of reminding RPG players that our games are absolutely some of the most complicated games on the face of the earth. We like to pretend they're not. They are absolutely complicated. And in fact, generally speaking, even a game like D&D that is more 5th edition D&D easier on the spectrum, I would say, uh, still, you're not going to learn it from a book. You're going to learn it from a friend. You're going to learn it from another person. And that is why the game spreads the way that it does. And uh, I, I think that I wanted to make a game that you could just open up a box and in less than an hour you could be playing. And I knew that that is a rarity. That's probably less than 10% of the RPGs out there. You can be playing in an hour or less. Um, and that was something that I really wanted to, to make sure that I was able to deliver. Uh, but like you're that, saying, that, restrictions that, kind of engender that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that is a great segue because what you just touched on there about what you know who the audience is was one of my key questions I wanted to ask about the game. So let me just mm. show. So so I have a, a copy here, and it's it's a beautiful uh, box set. The box is is just beautifully well done, and that was the the very first thing that uh, that attracted our, our patron uh, William's uh, eye to it. Is like that's a great looking box. Uh, has a 32-page uh, uh, rule booklet and scenarios with it. Ha you know, comes with um, I guess five different uh, class character sheets that, that mm -hmm. are you know specific to the game, which I thought was interesting because obviously the movie itself is about the quest of a single individual, right? And you've yes. turned it into a team-based game, among other things. One hundred percent. And so my and, and and it also comes with one d20. I guess I should say that out. So it is played. It is played purely with one single d twenty, which is kind of interesting. So my very first impression, exactly like you were just saying, Tim, is that, and and I think that this is important in the industry. Is I think this is a great option for people who are brand new to RPGs. If someone is looking for Pathfinder, if someone wants to play Squad Leader, this is not this is not that no. game. This is for brand brand new people, and I want that myself. Absolutely. Something I was, this is a good way to frame this. Like you're saying, if you're looking for Pathfinder, if you're looking for granularity, that was absolutely not my focus in this game. Something I was adamant on was that whether you were firing a crossbow, swinging a sword, or using a pole arm with reach, there would be no distinction between weapons. There would be no armor class in this. I knew that if you are basically setting it up where there's different rules for a halberd and a sword, then you are talking about a minimum of a 50 page rule book. There's actually like a good equation you can figure out right there. If the rules are gonna get this granular, then the rule book is gonna be this big. And I knew that I wanted it streamlined. I knew that I wanted the rules to focus less on those things like nuances of strategic combat and I wanted them to focus on more of the same things that the movie and the story are kind of focusing on. So for example, people were, you know, uh, I, I don't know really uh, uh, whether you can take this and design your own adventures. I argue you absolutely can take this and design your own adventures if you have a background in game mastering, especially and stuff, but there's not a strict set of rules for how you would do that. It's more like you observe the adventure and like most game masters do kind of interpret it on your own grounds. So I like to say that in that rule book, there is exactly what you need to play and then enough that you could play as much as you want within this game without getting overbearing about too many rules and too many mechanics. That's nice. That's nice. I can see that. And again, you know, my favorite thing to do is to DM for brand new players that have never played D&D mm -hmm. before. And they, they are creative and they're explorative and I learn things about the game. So I, I am always myself thinking about what can I design that's inviting for new players. And I think this is a, this is a very nice option. So let's talk about that I core mechanic. So yeah, go mm -hmm. ahead there. I, I just accessibility was definitely my main one of my main priorities. I think it is hard to make an RPG that feels accessible, and the more you streamline it, generally speaking, the better that's going to be. And towards your point, I love new players. I think new players are really some of the players who are bringing the most interesting and exciting developments to the table. One of my favorite things is to make sure that in any group of veterans, there is always at least one new or young 
player who is kind of at the table keeping the pot stirred. I like to say that they're like keeping things exciting, keeping things dynamic and uh, uh, not uh, preventing things from getting codified. Like we're all playing things one way. I think RPGs are best when people are playing things in just slightly different ways. Not so much that they're antagonizing each other, but uh, and that's why I wanted to make it accessible uh, so that new players would feel like this was just as accessible as a not even particularly complicated board game. That's really the level of difficulty I was aiming for. It was a fairly simple board game. I like that. I like that a lot. So let's talk, let's talk about the, what, what does exist for core mechanics. The core mechanic in Green Knight RPG is around honor and dishonor. And I, it's funny because I had to read the book. And then I was like, wait a minute. And I had to go back and I started rereading it to confirm something. And one thing is on the very first page, uh, you write, characters need not fear death. The ultimate punishment is dishonor. And mm -hmm. I, had to, I had to read the whole thing before I realized how, how totally literal you were being with that, that the yes. game doesn't have any hit points. Enemies mm -hmm. don't actually directly attack the players. Mm -hmm. But every single round, they're increasing dishonor which is kind of mm -hmm. like a, another ability score, actually. It's probably yes. going to be on the 1 to 20 scale, right? And if they max out, actually, the game is still done for them at that point. What was, Absolutely. Where, did, I've, where did that idea or inspiration come from to use that as your core mechanic? I have to admit, of course, there are classic games that, you know, uh, um, Pendragon is an example of like that chivalry themed game where it focuses a lot on the virtues and vices of your character. Do you do the honorable thing or not? But I would say my true inspiration was a lot of the more modern RPGs that are designed with accessibility in mind. I'm thinking of the Powered by the Apocalypse series of games, games that have very simple, very elegant, like they are multi-purpose resolution mechanics. And I would put D&D &D in this genre of, well, when you really look at it, D&D &D is all about one rule. You roll a d20 and you try to get a high roll. Everything after that is just the nuance and mechanics. And D&D &D does tend to get very granular, Pathfinder even more so. But that's the core mechanic. And in some ways, D&D &D succeeds because that is very elegant. But I was loving how a lot of these newer games, like Powered by the Apocalypse, is, uh, took that to a new extreme where it's like, we just have this resolution mechanic that adds more nuance. For example, in Powered by the Apocalypse games, you get one of three results. You either get a failure, a success, or a yes, but, or a yes and result. And I thought that was incredibly elegant that somewhere in your dice roll resolution is the possibility for not a binary success and failure, but like multiplicity. It's built in to this one core mechanic, and then you don't need a lot of extraneous other rules when you're building everything around one simple single core mechanic. So in this game, I knew that the focus could not be on a lot of the things that are focused on in D&D &D because the story is not focused on those. The story is all about whether you do something dishonorable or honorable. And so I like this idea that that's what everything boils down to. Everything is just an abstract or literal representation of your honor. And as that dishonor level goes up, you are getting closer and closer to losing. But there is also this strategic element of, well, okay, as your dishonor goes up, it's getting harder for you to succeed at honorable actions. But it's getting easier for you to succeed at dishonorable actions. There is a spectrum here, and there might be advantages or disadvantages to you being at either end of the spectrum. If you can get your dishonorable dishonor really low, you are a very honorable character. You're going to be, you're just on a, a steep incline towards success. But it actually as your dishonor creeps up and it just keeps creeping up constantly, then you need to make a decision. Actually, maybe I'll do something dishonorable here because I'm more likely to succeed and that will hurry us along. So in some ways there's resource mitigation where you are trying to essentially like make a strategic decision, speed, hurrying through the plot, through the content of these encounters is very important, but also doing so without letting your dishonor creep too high. And you're always making decisions based on that. And I kind of took that more core mechanic and was like, I hope this will work. And as I play tested it, as we worked it out, it was just really cool how that one simple mechanic then made people 
really talk out a whole spectrum of different decision making processes that they were going through. They were like, well, I want to do this, but I have to really think about what the impact will be for not just me, but for the team's dishonor and uh, talking with teammates, but also not talking with teammates when you know they're doing honorable stuff and you're doing dishonorable stuff. It was really cool how just from one simple rule, a whole set of interactions emerged. And to me, that's what makes a good RPG is when the rules are simple, but the interactions that emerge from those rules, the interpersonal dynamics, those can be as complex as you want them to be without being bogged down in like, well, hold on, I forgot, is it a plus four or a plus five that I'm working with? You're really just role playing out the decision making at that point. I, that, that's great. I, I suppose I should clarify for viewers that the, the, the precise mechanic of the Green Knight RPG is every single action you want to take is being rolled against your current dishonor score, right? Probably exactly. starts at 10, can go up, can go down. Mm -hmm. And if you are trying to perform an honorable deed, an honorable act, which is the default, you're trying to get the D20 above your dishonor. But exactly. if you are trying, if you're actually attempting to, to do a thing that's dishonorable, then you're, you're trying to roll the d20 under your dishonor. So that kind of feeds and into what Tim was just saying. Possible. About, right? Right. So if your dishonor gets really high, you might start deciding to lean into that and actually say, I want to do this in a dishonorable way. And you're actually more likely at that point. And then all of your abilities and skills, which can add like two to it at a time, uh, are always mm -hmm. beneficial. Right. So if you're trying to roll high, you can you can add your skills. And if you're trying to roll low, you can subtract them. So they are always beneficial. That's basically the core mechanic, as I understand it, I think. Um, Absolutely. So given so given that without giving us any spoilers, right, there's there's clearly multiple ways for this RPG for a play of this RPG to end. And you can't you can't lose hit points, but you can actually get out of the game by maxing mm -hmm. out your dishonor. So I'm wondering in, in the play tests and the live plays that you've seen, Tim, what is the most common way for this to end? Do people mm, fail before the end scene? Do they, do they sacrifice themselves? Do they, do they get the other possible ending? What, what happens most of the time? I couldn't it's gauge been... that because of the way that the, the dishonor is incrementing as, as a time factor. So I actually didn't know which way that would go. Absolutely. It's actually been really cool to see how it plays out because basically you're trying to prevent yourself from getting to 20 dishonor. The moment you get to 20 dishonor, the game tells you your character either you may think you are still brave, but you are running away or choosing to go back to town. Basically saying, hey, uh, no one will actually know if I go to meet the Green Knight or not. That's a huge part of the story is he could always go back. You can always go back and just be like, yo, I fought the Green Knight. That was nuts and everyone will respect you, but you won't respect yourself. So when you hit 20 Dishonor, it could be you waking up and realizing, like getting smart, you could role play it however you want, but the point is you are out of the game at that point. And the only way you can be saved is if other characters sacrifice their own honor to atone you. So there is a way for you to be brought back, but the way it's worked out in terms of balance is that usually no one gets knocked out of the game until like at least past the halfway mark. And by then people have kind of grokked the consequences. We've been losing and gaming dishonor for a while now. And it's been really fun to see in kind of like that three quarter mark of the game, how yes, some people will say, all right, everybody, I'm at 19 dishonor and I'm gonna do a dishonorable action, which gives you a point of dishonor whether you succeed or fail. So he knows he's condemning itself. And basically he's like, I succeed, I help everyone beat this encounter, and then I run into the woods. And then everyone has to go pull him out of the woods basically and talk him out of this. So uh, I have seen people kind of throw themselves and it's been very interesting to see somebody do something dishonorable for the team and sacrifice their own honor and in return the team helps them redeem themselves that has been an interesting dynamic to see happen i have also seen dynamics where right from the start players were like cool i'm gonna be dishonorable 
everybody have a great time but that's what i'm gonna be doing and some people are like locked in place where it's like i know that's literally the losing condition of the game but i'm gonna be essentially i like to call it like you're on the skateboard grinding the rail it's like you are running that line perfectly where it's like i'm not gonna cross over to 20 dishonor but i'm gonna keep it in the high teens the whole game and that's its own viable strategy of like being dishonorable but not too dishonorable and i've seen people kind of play things out this way as well and without spoiling too much i'll just say that there are a lot of fun things in kind of the end portion of the game the climax of the game when you're ostensibly supposed to be confronting the green knight how that encounter plays out is in many ways it's not that it's a brilliant mechanical exercise it's more the role playing that i see emerge in those final encounters as a climax of the story it's always so cool because very much like the green night story it's kind of like existential pretty philosophical and i could see that very easily having not been fun to play as a game and yet when i watch live streams and when i play test the game for people it's always really rewarding to see how they're like well my character does this and it's like really is that fun for you it's like well it's fun to role play in the context of a game about honor like this yes i think people really um role play in this game in a way that i don't see them in a lot of other other RPGs when it becomes the honor of your character is your main stat it's almost like where you are on the good and evil spectrum it or the law and chaos whatever you want to call the yeah. spectrum yeah. when that is the only mechanic you're really dealing with the way you role play your character I think changes fundamentally it's both in the mechanics but it's also up to you to decide how to interpret it um, and then the key was getting a good game where you talk about what is honor without that being the tedious slog where every time there's a dice roll, people are like, I didn't want this to be a debate honor game. That wouldn't be very right. fun when it's just a player in the DM debating what is honorable and what is not. But I love to see the way people question and discuss the honor of their actions in the context of this game. It's always really rewarding to kind of see how that plays out. That's great. And yeah, I hadn't thought about it before, but now that you've said it, I totally know which of my friends in my play group would totally go for the I'm actually pursuing dishonor in in the game. And the other thing, the other thing is, you know, uh, one thing that has honestly tormented me forever is that, uh, you know, just mentioned good or evil or law or chaos is that from its inception, D&D &D had law and chaos built in and really didn't yes. have any mechanics. Right. Yes. No and mechanics. I've been yearning, right. Absolutely. I've been yearning for a system it's... like this for a long time, and your, you know, your game gave me additional fodder to think about how exactly that could that could happen. Absolutely. To me, I like to say that in D and D, we are familiar with the paladin rogue dichotomy. There's the one person on the team who's like, "No, we follow the rules," and then the rogue is like, "I'll follow the rules while you're looking, maybe." Uh, and that dichotomy of two legitimate play styles that very often either produce a whole lot of fun or they produce no fun at all because the people in question are role playing that paladin rogue dichotomy. But D and D may, in their interpretation, not be about the paladin rogue dichotomy. It might be about everybody getting a fair share of the treasure, and then when the rogue is up to their shenanigans, everyone's like, "This isn't fun. This isn't what I want the game to be about." Your role playing is getting in the way of me enjoying the way I want to enjoy D and D. Whereas, because the mechanics in this game are all about dishonor and honor, I see people embrace. It's like, "Well, I'm going to keep paladining," and the rogue is like, "Well, I'm going to keep." roguing and they're just looking at each other like fine fine and like that's how this game plays out a little bit more it's the meat and potatoes of the game as opposed to whenever the rogue paladin dichotomy interrupts D, &D it's because they're making it the focus of the game in a group that didn't want it to be the focus of the game so it's just kind of out of balance in my perception that's great that's great and it sounds like you know clearly a lot of experience uh on your part fed into uh, making this design fruitful, um, and I'm it's, it's, it's I, I totally I I'm totally glad I get an opportunity to, to chat with you about where it's coming from. Um, but it, but it when it comes to RPGs, it's kind of interesting because it's like game design. Is, there's so many ways you can learn good game design, but RPGs, I think that unless you are running 
RPGs and I run, you know, as many as six to 10 in a week. So I just have the hours of being like, okay, I know what happens when groups reach this particular section. When I run games for kids, very often they're just verbalizing what the adults are quietly thinking. So when I run an adventure for kids and they're like, <laughs> where's the treasure we just beat this guy where's the treasure and i'm like oh that's what the adults were thinking when they were getting surly after this okay. boss fight because they were wondering the same thing and so i think there is an invaluable element of game design that you only learn from running DD &D because most of DD isn't in the numbers you cannot look at the rules of DD &D and understand more than 50 percent of what happens in DD. you need to be at the table watching humans play DD, &D, and then you will understand the majority of what's going on in this it's like you're looking at a 2d image of a 3d object when you're just looking at the rules and trying to parse out what is what is this game from a rule book you need to see people playing a game in order to really appreciate an rpg i think in a way that you don't actually when it comes to like chess like you can figure out how people play chess without people being involved in that process because there's only one kind of way to play it that's not entirely true but it's more true for chess than it is for DD &D kind that's that's how i interpret it you're really missing if you're missing the human element that's more than 50 percent of what you're working with when it comes to game design you've got to play test your game with trolls you've got to play test your game with role players you've got to play test your game with power gamers and i try to play test my games with as many different types of players as i can that's usually my priority I love that observation, Tim. That that is that is just that is just gold right there. Do you? Th and, you know, we've been talking in the last year about how, you know, when I when I got involved in role playing games, it was much harder. I guess so. I I'm in. The, so personally, I and my co host Paul are in the very small number of people where we actually learned RPGs and D and D from the book with no no other people around. And yes. we were. I was in a rural place. I, you know, I got a D and D basic set. I was the only person in my friend group who had ever heard of it. And I was always a DM from day one and always teaching other people. And maybe I have some kind of way out in left field variant of D and D in my head because of that. Do you think yes. that's become easier to see like with the rise of online streaming? Like, like to me, I feel like it's a very different environment nowadays. Absolutely. I would agree with that. First of all, you pointed out you played a variant. I think that's true for everybody. And there are as many different versions of D&D &D as there are D&D &D groups and dungeon masters. It's almost hard to compare Dungeons and Dragons at one table to another in a weird way. So, yeah, I, I absolutely think that, um, uh, sorry, you, you had said, um, uh, with that. Sorry, I, had, I lost my train of thought. I'm wondering if, if the fact that we, we stream by video gaming now, yes. whether it's easier for people to understand what that human element is like. I think 100% yes, and that's the biggest difference that streaming is making, is in some ways it might be codifying a one way to play, but I think that's only right. a limitation of like, okay, if we only have five streams, then we're only gonna see mm -hmm. five ways to play. The more streams there are, the more we will see how much different variety there is. And I think that streaming is becoming the normal way to get access to D and D, yeah. because I like to say a very controversial, like hot take opinion is that th uh, y there are so many people who learn D and D from the books, and that's why I love you are, and I did too. I learned D and D okay. from the book. Okay. But I love to say you don't learn D and D from the books because that's such a controversial thing to say in our hobby when so much many of us <laughs> in the hobby have learned from the books. But I would argue that most people in the hobby who have played D&D &D are that side person who didn't pick up the books, who are just kind of being led by the dungeon master who did read the books, who is leading them into this experience. And most people who play D&D &D would be learning it, not from going through a player's handbook, but from peer-to-peer -peer transfer, from sitting down with a dungeon master who is good at taking them through the rules in a way that they will appreciate. And the fact that m 
that's been hard to do for so long that you need to have a friend. You just need to have a friend who already plays D and D. And that's not true for most people. So me being a professional game master, most of the reason I was able to get into that profession is because there were so many people who didn't have access to a friend who would teach them D and D and they were not willing to pick up a book. And so you got the people who learn from the books and that's a group. And then you've got the people who learned from the people who learned from the books and that's an even bigger group and then you got this gigantic group of people who would play D D if they had a friend to teach them but you cannot convince those people to pick up a book and to learn D D themselves they just won't do it they probably won't even show up at wednesday nights at a game store if you were to literally tell them listen they they do adventures league like you can do this there's so many people who just they're like, ah, I'm curious, but I'm not that curious. And those are generally the people that I'm kind of getting in touch with, with my work and stuff like that. So uh, I just think that um, it's funny that when you talk to D&D players at a convention, when you talk to people deep in the hobby, yes, it's probably true that you'll meet a lot of people who, I learned D&D from the books, you learned D&D from the books, of course, that's the normal way to learn D&D. But statistically, I'll bet it's not the case. I'll bet actually the majority of people who have played D&D, maybe we wouldn't identify them as the hardcore players, but the statistical of majority of people who have sat down and played a game of D&D, they learned from a person. They did not learn from a book. And uh, I'm generally just stepping in as the role of that friend introducing people to D&D in bite-sized chunks. I like to say D&D, you shouldn't start with character creation with new players. That's a, such a common mistake. Okay. Okay. Such an easy mistake to make. But generally speaking, if you're going to a new player and saying like, oh, this game is going to be great. But first, we've got to do a lot of math. It's like, no, they're not. They don't know what those numbers mean. They're not going to have a lot of fun figuring them out until they play just one. It just takes one session of D&D. &D. And then at that point, they might say, scrap this character. I want a whole new character. I know what I'm doing now. But mm -hmm. they've got to have a little mm -hmm. bit of experience first. And I'm all about like, there might be two minutes of rule explanation before we are telling the story. Everything after that, we will learn while we are playing. And I think that is in many ways the best way to learn RPGs is to play RPGs, even if you don't know what you're doing until you learn what you're doing, kind of. It's a, 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 like learning a language, kind of. It's like, how do you, like, well, conversations with people. But if you don't know any of the language, where do you start? But yet it true that it's kind of like incremental and that's how babies learn language you make it you know a couple of words and then you keep learning and it's you're learning something within something it's it's a strange way but immersion we say is the best way to learn language that's how i argue you should learn D, &D kind of full immersion in a sense and then all of a sudden all the terminology all the numbers you're learning mean something it's always contextualized and i think people learn most quickly and efficiently when it is contextualized. If I'm telling people, oh, you'll use athletics in the game for this, and they're trying to frame that, that's not as effective as, okay, make an athletics check. And they're like, what's that? And I go, oh, oh, it's this number over here. And they're like, oh no, I'm bad at that. I wish I played a strong character. And I say, hey, you know what, next week, you want to play a strong character? You absolutely can. That's the way to properly learn about how athletics works as opposed to trying to figure out D&D before you've ever played D&D, kind of. It, it's, it's so funny, Tim, because maybe I'm a slow study because I've, I've, been, I've been playing D&D for approximately 40 years, and I've been wrestling with this exact issue, and I have made that mistake in the past. I think I've finally mm -hmm. learned to come off the real lows. And I've totally been thinking recently about this exact issue of you kind of need two paths into the game for a complete newbie versus an expert. Because if you look at the original D&D box set, the, you know, the, there was one way to make a character and the player didn't have anything to do with it. It actually literally yes. says the DM rolls the abilities, informs the player, and then that will tell them what class they ought to be. Mm -hmm. But that's not going to make an expert player happy, like you just said, because they're going to have a particular role in mind that they want to fit into. And mm -hmm. like I've been thinking recently, you kind of really want both of those options available mm -hmm. for uh, for new versus experienced players. That's a really and great observation. It, and it's so, inter it's so interesting to me that the beginning of D&D &D was all about 
player, you don't need to know anything. Dungeon Master, right. you need to know literally everything. Literally right. all the player's stats. It's, it's this old sensibility of like, I need to have literally copies of your character sheets so that you don't even know what I'm rolling against you. Whereas now we have more, We it's like an, an observation that it's actually kind of fun to be like, hey, what's your passive perception? Why are you asking? Like those dynamics are actually <laughs> fun as opposed to it was more old school where it's like, you're an author these people don't even know what you're doing it was a lot of pressure on the game master and then almost no pressure on the players and i think the advent of video games helped to balance that out a little bit more to raise the player up to the status of like you know what you're doing here so participate build your character and build it well maybe and uh you know go back and forth with the dungeon master a little more negotiating whereas in the past it was like don't you dare negotiate with me i am all powerful Powerful. Now there's a bit more on the player side and a bit, I argue, only out of necessity did we do this, taking the burden off the Game Master. I think it only happened because we discovered it's like, oh, D&D's been out for a decade. How many Dungeon Masters are there? Like a thousand on planet Earth. Like, it's just too <laughs> much pressure. For these people it was, it was so rare to find a game master and so much rarer to find a game master who could do all the stuff that you actually had fun playing with them so only i think they only made dungeon master and then they tried to be like oh we need to teach people how to dungeon master we need to make these books training mechanisms a dungeon master guide to allow people to learn how to game master but even then it was like well you're teaching people how to basically do all of D&D, which is essentially how to design D&D from the ground up for all intents and purposes. And then as we like whittle down what the game master had to do and streamline the process for them. I mean, I I, I love to not say nice things about fourth edition every now and then. Fourth edition did took right. steps in the direction of making things more like, hey, dungeon master, you're just plugging things in. You're just plugging this monster, this monster, and this monster, and boom, you have a great encounter. I love the fourth edition did that made it so that encounters were easy for a, a new dungeon master to kind of just slap together by adding up a few numbers, basically. I, I, I think that um, it's been a real success trying to make game mastering more accessible, though nothing has made it as accessible as live streaming, I think. Live streaming has done a great job of making it like, oh, I see what they're doing here. And in particular, when it's not just Matt Mercer, because he's so good. Uh, and it's hard to watch Matt Mercer and then be like, oh, I see what he's doing behind the scenes, except his players are so good that they will actually push him onto his heels. And then you get to see how he's doing it. But I love that there's so many streams now that eventually someone is going to run into a dungeon master where they are going to say, I think I can do what this person's doing. I think I could step into their shoes and take my friends through this role as well. And that's what you really want. When I dungeon master for people, that's a priority, is that I'm not only teaching them the rules, I'm also teaching them what I'm doing so that if I'm not there for their next game, one of them will feel comfortable stepping in and being like, I can run the game for all of you this time. And I kind of want to see D&D games like appearing everywhere in my wake, kind of. That's what I hope for. <laughs> It, it, we we uh, the, the 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 wandering DMs agree, Tim. That is exactly that is exactly the same thing that we want. And my, my friend Paul has said, I want to be the Johnny Appleseed of D and D and just be uh, behind me I, all over the place. I right? love that metaphor. <laughs> I take it a step further. I say it's like spores because it's even better than seeds. Okay. You're just dropping <laughs> spores everywhere you go. Sometimes I think I have a conversation with somebody that didn't go anywhere, and then all of a sudden they're playing D and D with their friends. I'm like, well, that conversation I didn't think would lead to D and D and it did for that person. That's so cool. I think um, it, it's very important that it's like, yeah, you think D&D is learned from a rule book and yet it's the interpersonal interactions that we have that really get people excited about D&D. &D. So I might not need to teach D&D &D to somebody, but if I have a conversation with them and they feel the passion that I have for this hobby, that might be all that it takes. So very often I tell people, you know, my brilliant skills as a game mastering, my knowledge of the rules, these are not usually what 
really I think people are getting from me. They're getting a sense of passion and love for this game. And I, I even if they're like completely like, what is this? At the very least, they're like, man, this guy's excited about something. I want to know what it is. And seeing people, I don't think there's anything more rewarding. I used to work at a comic at a, a, a board game cafe, the Brooklyn Strategist, where I overheard a and d game that was there one Saturday morning, where it was like, Somebody had brought their girlfriend. They had not done a great job of explaining to her what D&D was going to be. She was being quiet a lot of the time. And then all of a sudden I heard her say from across the room, oh, wait, he's listening to what we say. And then he's folding it into the story as we go. And he's kind of improvising. And that's how your sister is now in the town where we went, oh, this is cool. And I was like, I wanted to hear. I wanted to run across the room to start high-fiving people. Just me, nothing was going to beat that moment in the game, the moment of understanding. That's the moment right. I had when I looked at D&D and I was like, oh, if you're the wizard, the rats only need to hit this. If you're the fighter, they need to hit a higher number. Oh, it's not about rats and wizards and fighters. You can do <laughs> anything with this system, anything you want. It's Legos. It's how I imagine kids feel playing Minecraft now, where it's like, what, I chop down a tree and, oh, I build a world in this game. Like, that's what you do with this rule set. And uh, watching people make that jump, that is the most rewarding thing, because it means that they are now, it's their game. It's not my game anymore. It's theirs. And I, to me, I don't think there's any game that has so much complexity, but then so much accessibility when it comes to new players wandering in and being like, well, can I do this? And I'm like, well, none of these people think it's a good idea, but I say go for it. Absolutely. <laughs> That's a good idea, 100%. <laughs> That's fantastic. Speaking of, speaking of things that are verdant and growing and full of spores, um, yes. the, you know, my, my last question, I guess, uh, we're kind of up against the, our time here is the, the, the cover of the green Knight uh, box set says a quest, uh, for honor starter set. And one of the things that I actually was one of my favorites is the very last page of the rule book has a 24 challenges, which are like one paragraph suggestions about other adventures, which which allude to other A24 films. And honestly, I had to yes. sit down and decode which films they were, honestly. And for some reason, for me, these little, at the end of an adventure, like other things you can do, like really stick in my head like that. So is there any possibility of like future expansion sets or more supplements that kind of build those things out, Tim? I would say that there is the possibility for anything for sure. Fingers crossed. I would love to see more support for the Green Knight game or any p possible uh, RPGs coming from A24 in the future. I think uh, everyone's really happy with how the Green Knight game kind of went. So who knows? There, I, I, I know I'm a big fan of their films and The Lighthouse and Midsommar are all great. So I think there are many films they've already done that are rife for kind of like RPG opportunities uh, and, and in the future, who knows? So I, I think uh, we might may see uh, more releases in the future, possibly. I would love I would love to see that, Tim. Uh, so Grant, that we're up against our time. Is there anything else that uh, we we should have touched on the, that you wanted to share about uh, the the film, The Green Knight, or uh, the RPG that our viewers should know about? Absolutely. I mean, you can definitely pick up the Green Knight game at the A24 store. I think it's only available there. Uh, and so you can pick it up. Uh, they still have supplies, I think. And uh, obviously, go check out the Green Knight movie. I enjoyed it quite a bit. And I think anyone who's a fan of RPGs is going to enjoy a lot of the atmosphere and feel and tone of a film like that, for sure. I, I do have, uh, if you go to my website, timwoods.com, that's Tim with two M's, uh, woods.com, you can kind of see this work that I've done with the Green Knight. You can see some of my other work. You you can find out more about my work as a professional game master and i have a, a book out right now it's a book of random tables for cities and towns where if you're a game master and as parties in dungeons and dragons are want to do you they might be like cool we go to this tavern and then we try to rob the place across the street what's the store and the game master didn't prepare that so you're flipping through you it's essentially a book of random tables where you can generate a whole town if you really want to for filling in the gaps of what you couldn't prepare based on your party party shenanigans and hopefully in the soon uh hopefully soon i will be having another book of random tables for dungeons coming out uh in the near future so we'll see how that goes 
That sounds awesome. And of course, we will have links to everything that Tim just told us about in the archive on YouTube in perpetuity after this. So Tim Woods, thank you so much for telling us about the Green Knight RPG. We hope we can get you back again sometime in the future. Would love to. That would be fantastic. Thanks so much, Dan. Awesome. Thanks so much, Dan. Excellent. Thanks. Well, I think uh, t t the award for most enthusiastic guest of Wandering Games <laughs> ever must go to Tim Woods. <laughs> right, right. I can see now again. You know, Tim is a is is a pro DM, and I think that's what he spends most of yeah. his time on. Like he said, uh, six to ten games uh, a week. I think they run like three hours. And he also has said he does one to three hours of prep time before each session, which I thought was uh, was impressive. So that's that's a full time job right there, and you can see why he's so successful at it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Great energy. So, so you told me that uh, you and Tim were going to convince me to go see the movie. Uh, Did that work? Did that work, Paul? <laughs> well, I mean, it doesn't take much to make me want to go see a movie. So, uh, <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, I, actually, I'm curious, Dan, having, having seen the movie and having looked over the, the rules of the game, what, what do you think, if you were going to run a game of the Green Knight, would you, have, would you want to have all players who have seen the film at the table? Oh, what a great idea. I think that I think it honestly works really well either way because you're going to you're going to be surprised whichever uh, camp you're in. If you don't know anything about the property or the myth, you're going to be surprised by the series of encounters that Tim strung together. And if you did watch the movie, um, the the thematics are totally there. Really he really nailed the thematics like he said, but the exact way that the encounters play out are still going to surprise you. So honestly, I think that players in either camp are actually going to have a good time exploring and finding out the uh, the the tricks that Tim put into the game here. Interesting. Yeah, I think it would work well either way. Very cool. It would be nice to have a mixed group. Actually, have some people that have seen the movie and some people have not, and then at, you'd probably have. I bet you'd have these interactions of the the players that haven't seen it to go. Oh, I guess we got to do this. And the players that have seen the movie maybe once are going to go, no, 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 that's not how it works. You got to do this, <laughs> and then out, right, and then yeah, after the yeah. scene, the players that did see the movie go, oh, this isn't working out the same way at all. <laughs> 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 I really have egg on my face. <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> yeah, I bet that would be great. <laughs> uh, any thoughts about the uh, the game design, Paul? Um, you know, so like, you know, some of us have been playing Quest lately. Mm -hmm. that has this same idea of like one mechanic it's always a d20 it's kind of the same score um what what is what is that system what did tim's system most sound like to you um in terms of like relation to other systems i don't know um, yeah i yeah. think um i'm not sure uh i'm trying to think of other other games that that feels familiar to uh, I'm, not, I'm not drawing anything in particular. Okay. You have a particular. I was kind. Of, I'm like. I was kind of leaning on your slightly yeah. wider net than I guess. Like I don't know if that's more in the, like the the fate or dreadish type, you know, zone or something like that. But I'm not. I don't have encyclopedic not. I only yeah. know about D and D. So I was like, <laughs> this game is not. This is not a game is not exactly like D and D. Where's yeah. my hit points? Yeah. yeah. I mean, when you get into games like say Fiasco, right? There's definitely a single Here mechanic, but the mechanic is so rarely used and so yep. trivial that it really is leaning on the the improvisational. I can't think of a game that is more like a traditional RPG like D&D, but still tries to simplify like that down to just a single reused mechanic. Um, maybe the ubiquity system, but I haven't played a lot of that. Um, and, I, and again, I don't think the goal there is like really the same, I think, as the Green Knight, where the Green Knight, it feels like the goal is to really um, be kind to new players, right? Like that's what I feel like he's. That's, that's the sense yes. I got from that, from that interview was that that it's really, Great. you know, to be approachable by 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 newbies, which I think is is interesting. It's an, it's a laudable goal. Um, uh, fascinating, I think. What really well that that's a great analysis, Paul, because you know, that's I, totally what comes. That's totally what the game is like. You know, it you, reminds you me it. of uh, a discussion I heard on Fear of a Black Dragon podcast recently, where they were talking about what is the best game system to use for newbies, and they basically went in the direction of saying like, well, games like you know D and D or Pathfinder or you know anything like that, where there's like a lot of rules, is maybe is going to be overwhelming to a player. Um, whereas games with too few rules, where you get into the realm of like super improv story games like like fiasco are gonna have too few 
And they're saying that, like, you know, a new player really needs something to hang their hat on. So I like that idea of sort of like, we're just going to very simplify me reusable mechanic. I think that's clever. Yep. Yep, I agree. And there's 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 one number in the Green Knight RPG that you're really focused on, and that's this dishonor number. And you and, and you know the interesting thing to me is that the game actually gave additional texture to the movie. Hmm. Like I'd seen the movie, talked about it with you know talked about it with Isabel here for a couple days, and then I was like, I think I actually understand what the movie was talking about better uh, interesting. by having seen Tim's RPG of it. Actually, it works. It works super well. You're always focused on this number and. You've got to be thinking about what your honor dishonor uh, goal is at the moment, and it really it's really focusing, but it's very concrete. I've I've always really enjoyed looking at movies that are adaptations of of books because uh, I find that really fascinating to say where the filmmakers chose one one direction versus another. I remember when Lord of the Rings first came out, I hadn't actually read the books yet, and so I made a point of reading each oh. book just prior to the movie. So I found that a very interesting comparison to make. I never really thought of like extending that into other media like this and, and and certainly never envisioned a day where i'd be comparing a movie to the role-playing game version of right. the movie that's why right um, exactly viewers if you've seen the movie and uh and played the game or, or one or the other want to want to make some comparisons uh please leave some comments in our in our thread below i'd love to hear where you feel that the movie impacted the game or the game impacted the movie uh, it's really fascinating. Definitely, definitely. And, you know, big shout out again to our uh, viewer and patron, William. We would not have known about the Green Knight RPG. We were talking about the movie at one point, and then uh, William pointed out on our Discord that there was an RPG, which Paul or I, we wouldn't have been looking for. So thank you so much for pointing that out. And uh, big thanks to Tim and A24 Films, of course, for their time and letting us review the product. Uh-huh. Great, what a, what a great yeah, box. Yeah, nice. um, as we mentioned, we do have links in the YouTube description to Tim Wood's website for professional DMing services that he does online, uh, and also the A24 Films website for movie tickets and the Green Knight RPG box set. As of today, as of us doing us, uh, this live show today, the movie is still in theaters. It looks great on the big screen. If you can see it that way, that is, that is personally what I would advise, but it's also available wherever you rent movies as of just a couple days ago. So you do have options at the moment. Great. Just go see it. <laughs> um, remember, of course, if you're new to uh, The Wandering DMs show here, remember that you can like and follow and subscribe to us, The Wandering DMs, on YouTube and Twitch and Twitter and Facebook and also GitHub if you're a coder. And we do have the handle Wandering DMs on all of those sites. So please look for us there for updates. If you prefer to listen to this show in audio-only podcast format, you can get those podcasts at our website at wanderingdms.com. Or you can find us on other podcast carriers like Google Podcasts, iTunes, Spotify. If you're listening to this podcast on one of those other carriers, please take a moment to rate and review our show there. That helps other users of that site find our show, and we really appreciate it. We really do. As always, big thanks to our patrons who support the Wandering DM shows. And if you would like to join them, please do visit patreon.com slash wandering DMs. You'll see a couple different tiers, and that way you can get discounts on our merch. You can get access to our private Discord server where there's always fascinating conversations, and we learn our th stuff ourselves like there's a Green Knight RPG, which is how we learned about it and made this show, as a matter of fact. And we try to have monthly behind-the-scenes videos, polls, and surveys and an after-party chat on the Discord video that we'll have in just about five minutes after this show is over. Uh, Paul will, should be back uh, Monday, tomorrow night, 8 p.m., for another 10 Dead Rats session of our D&D Warhammer mashup. And don't forget, we are live every Sunday at 1 p.m. Eastern time, so we hope you'll join us again next week for another thought-provoking discussion. We'll see you then.